Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and um, I'm, I've chosen two studies that I want to talk about today. One has to do with pancreatic cancer and the other I guess isn't a study, it's a website I wanted to point out to you that I think is kind of exciting. I'll explain that when I get to it. But um, let's start with uh, pancreatic cancer uh, which has gotten a lot of attention lately. There have been so many celebrities and famous people that have died from it and it is one of the worst forms of cancer that you can get. The one year survival rates are only 20% only 4% of patients are alive at five years. And by the time most people are diagnosed, the cancer has spread and surgery really isn't viable. But even for those who do qualify, the survival time is only 18 to 20 months. So, I mean, dismal, anyway you look at it. Um, there are a couple of treatments that offer slightly better results, but to tell you the truth, there's nothing that even pushes 50% survival rate at, at five years. So you don't want to get pancreatic cancer. That's the take home point here. So how do people get pancreatic cancer? What's the leading cause? Well, you probably know what I'm going to say. It's diet. Um, the high-fat, animal foods-based Western diet is usually responsible. There are exceptions, but usually responsible. A study presented this year at the American Association for Cancer Research's conference on pancreatic cancer showed that feeding mice a high-fat, high-calorie diet in very short time caused obesity, insulin resistance, pancreatic inflammation, and the beginnings of pancreatic cancer. Researchers used mice with a genetic mutation that occurs in the majority of human pancreatic cancers. Those mice were fed a corn oil based diet and 90% of the mice became obese. All of the mice developed insulin resistance and pancreatic inflammation and both of these can promote the growth of pancreatic cancerous cells. The corn oil fed mice also developed more precancerous lesions and more advanced precancerous lesions than the mice fed a more normal diet. And so the researchers noted, and I think this is interesting, that the mutation alone may not be responsible for pancreatic cancer. All of the mice have the mutation, but only the mice fed the high fat, high calorie diet developed pancreatic cancer. Very important point here because so many people still believe, and I, I just addressed a couple of groups this week where this was quite the point of discussion. People really believe and have been taught that diseases like pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, heart disease run in families and that their genetic predisposition is the principal thing that will determine whether or not they get these diseases. Not true. Not, it is true that you can have genetic predisposition, but whether or not you switch on that, the expression of those genes is the issue here. And you do have a choice about that because it's largely dependent upon what you eat. Now, previous studies have linked fat and calorie consumption with many forms of cancer, including pancreatic cancer. And also, previous studies have shown that diet's more important than genes. So um, one thing that is becoming more common, and, and again, it came up a few times at talks that I was giving this week, is people being advised to um, have genetic testing to determine whether they're at high risk for certain forms of cancer. And I'm very opposed to that. I think it takes normal people and turns them into patients. And um, we know from, from all lots of research that your genes are only a tiny part of this. So if you don't want to get pancreatic cancer, get the fat out of your diet, get the animal foods reduced or eliminated from your diet, and start eating a whole foods plant-based diet like the one we recommend here. Okay, now I'm very excited to report what I'm going to talk to you about now. And that is that doctors are now, very large established medical groups of doctors are starting to talk about the problems we're having in this country with useless tests and treatments. And I mean, that really is a sign that we're doing way too much in terms of diagnostic testing and treatment. If even the groups that benefit from this over-testing and over-treating are speaking out against it. So, Nine groups representing 374,000 doctors develop lists called Five Things Physicians and Patients Should Question and posted them on a website. I'll tell you the website in just a second here. But the groups included the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American College of Cardiology, that shocked me, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and the American College of Physicians. It's really the first time that any of these groups have publicly acknowledged that there may be patient harm that results from some of the very things that their uh, participants and, and members provide. 
Now, I won't read to you all the lists of five and that sort of thing. I'm just going to give you some highlights. Uh, some of the recommendations include an acknowledgement that most tests for diagnosing allergies are unproven and shouldn't be used, not to prescribe antibiotics for sinus infections, finally, not to recommend imaging for people with back pain, not to order DEXA scans for women under the age of 65, and not to perform pap tests on women under the age of 21 or those who have had hysterectomy for conditions other than cancer. The American College of Cardiology recommends against routine stress tests for asymptomatic patients, and the American College of Radiology adv um, advises against imaging in response to headaches. Gastroenterologists are encouraged to prescribe the lowest dose possible of drugs to treat reflux. So um, again, the information isn't shocking. I've been talking about this for years and years. Dr. McDougall has been talking about it for two and a half decades before I ever get involved in this business. But where the information is coming from is what I find so um, shocking and, and surprising in a nice sort of way. Usually, I'm not very happy with news that comes out about medicine. This kind of makes me happy. So. Most of the 2.7 trillion we're spending in the United States on healthcare is for useless tests that lead to unnecessary treatment, drugs that don't address the cause of disease or reduce the risk of death, hospitalizations that can be avoided, and end of life treatment that doesn't prolong life. If these were eliminated, if we got rid of all the stuff we're doing that really doesn't help and often hurts people, we wouldn't have a financial crisis anymore. There would be enough money to pay for people to get the care that they need. And, and I, you know, sometimes people think I'm anti-doctor or I'm anti-healthcare. I'm not. I'm anti-useless doctors and healthcare. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. We just want to make sure that we only provide things that are actually useful. Now, the problem is going to be acting on these recommendations. And the reason is, well, there are a bunch of reasons. The first one is that patient and ad advocacy groups, many of which are funded by the drug companies, argue that when you bring this kind of thing up that care is being rationed. And that's ridiculous. Getting rid of bad care is not rationing. Patients tell stories about how a useless drug or procedure saved them. And whether or not the stories are true, when the scientific information is clear that most people are not being helped by a test or a treatment, we just have to stop doing it. Um, doctors report fear that they'll be sued for malpractice and hospitals hang on to their turf. Useless testing and treatment and unnecessary hospitalization is what keeps them in business. So um, I'm just looking at this as a step in the right direction, that a bunch of traditional organizations are now coming out and saying what, what many of us have been saying for years, that this stuff should stop. And uh, I'm hoping that it will empower more healthcare professionals to speak out and to have more discussions with their patients. Um, in reference to doctors fearing uh, being sued for malpractice, I think if doctors would take the time to talk to their patients and have their patients make an informed decision, they'd find that uh, they'd be less likely to be sued. Um, and that's an informed decision about all kinds of things, not just the issues I'm talking about here. So um, anyway, good news. Better, more people talking about this will certainly, I think, over time lead to better decision making. And if you want to look at the long list, the whole, see the whole thing, you can go to choosewisely.org and uh, you'll see all the nine groups and the five recommendations for each group. And um, I would take a lot of these further. I have a lot more things that I think are useless than they list there. But again, step in the right direction. That's all I'm asking for is can we make some progress regularly on this issue? All right, that's it. So I will be back next Tuesday. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would benefit from watching it. Have a great day and a great weekend.